Okay. Um, hello, everyone. So this is, uh, we're going to try to spend the next uh, at least 45 minutes or, or maybe an hour, depending on our, uh, the people on the stage here, uh, to discuss uh, regional energy ecosystems uh, and how they can drive decarbonation. Um, so I won't present the people uh, uh, right now. I'll wait a little bit, uh, maybe to express a, a shift that we're seeing right now uh, as we're, we're going from a, a classic client-provider uh, relationship to an approach based on partnerships. And Quebec has, uh, has some great examples, uh, but I'm very curious to hear the examples that uh, uh, our friend from um, uh, Exergy will share with us from Stockholm. Um, in Quebec, um, we've been seeing examples where either in, in Erkem or in ArcelorMittal, and they introduced themselves after, where we're actually seeing more and more projects being developed uh, locally, uh, and which is something that we haven't been used to. Although, a hundred years ago, aluminum smelters uh, developed themselves based on that project, but since then, we haven't really seen uh, local partnerships uh, being developed. And so, um, we also see examples very similar in Europe, and in some instances, I feel that in Europe, you're much more advanced than we are uh, in Quebec and in North America. So to discuss these um, uh, regional energy ecosystems, I have three uh, important guests with me. Um, the first one, uh, and I'll start with uh, our, our Swedish friend, is Anders Egelrud. He is the CEO of Stockholm Exergy. I have Julien Ampron who is uh, Vice President Corporate Affairs and Strategy from ArcelorMittal Mining Canada. And last but not least, uh, I have Jean-Francois Nallet, who is Senior Director, Global Government, Public and Regulatory Affairs from Enerchem. So, gentlemen, maybe to start, uh, not on the, on the subject, but maybe just to uh, put everybody aware of what you do and what is the organization you represent. Maybe I'll start with you, Julien. Uh, few words on ArcelorMittal. Everybody knows ArcelorMittal, but maybe they don't know ArcelorMittal Canada, so I'll start with you. Okay, thank you, Hubert. So uh, I'm Julien Lampron, uh, responsible for the corporate affairs and the strategy for ArcelorMittal Mining Canada. ArcelorMittal, uh, as you may all know, is the second largest producer of uh, steel in the world. But it's also, and this is maybe a uh, unknown fact, we are also the sixth mining company in the world, uh, operating more than uh, uh, 55 million tons of material per annum. And in ArcelorMittal Mining Canada only, we are responsible of 60% of that production. So it's a very large operation. Um, we have two mines in Quebec, in the North Shore region of, of Quebec, which is called also uh, a resource region for the Quebec. Uh, we, uh, we produce 25 million tons of iron ore, high purity iron ore per year, which uh, 10 million tons of, uh, of this concentrate is transformed into pellets, iron pellets. Uh, we are operating also a uh, railway, which is the largest private railway in, uh, in Canada, and the second largest uh, port, uh, private port uh, in Canada, uh, just, uh, just before Montreal. So it's really, uh, really a big operation in, in Canada. Um, the project that we are uh, here to discuss is uh, uh, we maybe maybe uh, we'll just finish before we start about your project. We'll just finish the presentations, sure. and after that, we'll we'll go to uh, no to the project. Uh, so maybe Anders, you want to go uh, next? Thanks. Uh, I, thanks, I can do that. Uh, I'm the CEO then of Stockholm Exity. Uh, we are a utility company from Sweden. We are mainly operating in the Stockholm Greater Area, and uh, we're we are the largest district heating and district cooling company. Uh, and uh, we are producing quite significant amount of electricity capacity for the region in Stockholm. And we are also uh, now aiming for 
taking into operation one of the largest biocarbon capture and storage facility which are with, with aim to start operation 2027. So that is more in, in a nutshell what okay. I come from. Thank you. And then uh, uh, Jean-Francois, maybe on, on NRCM. Sure. So uh, is that on? Yeah, good. Uh, thank you very much for the invite. Thanks, uh, uh, um, Julien, for having uh, initiated this, this panel. And thank you very much for being here. Uh, Enercam, uh, Enercam provides uh, a large scale, uh, scalable, flexible, commercial, uh, commercial scale um, solutions for the hard to abate sectors, marine, aviation, and chemicals with the lowest CI and, and the best in class abatement costs. So how we do it, we've developed over the years a gasification technology, very unique gasification technology, uh, where we produce low carbon fuels and chemicals from waste. So large diversity of type of, uh, of waste materials from municipal sided waste down to residual biomass and everything in between. Um, we've done it uh, over all those years uh, and, and we'll speak about, you know, uh, in terms of what we can uh, generate uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the synergies with, uh, with us being, uh, being a waste uh, solution uh, for the communities that, that we're developing our projects in. Um, but from waste, we have this platform where we produce syngas and then methanol. Uh, methanol that can be used as is, as marine fuel. Also, methanol is a building block uh, for uh, other type of fuels, including sustainable aviation fuels, uh, but also DME, for example, uh, Demeter ethyl, uh, ethyl, which is a replacement for LPG, uh, off -grid, uh, for off-grid applications, uh, very challenging sector to decarbonize. So that speaks about the flexibility of our technology. We have a projects in operation in Alberta, uh, Canada, and Edmonton, uh, where we co-locate with the waste, fa uh, uh, waste management facility. Uh, we take the green bags, we remove the inerts, what's recyclable, what's compostable, and we take the rest of it. So we use uh, and we transform uh, the trash of the trash, if you want, right? So uh, this is how we, uh, we take that, that material and we upgrade it, uh, we upgrade it to a high value product, uh, low carbon fuels, and we have a project uh, with our partners Shell, Suncor, and Proman, and in, 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 in Government of Quebec through IQ in, in Quebec, just out of, uh, of Montreal, uh, $1.2 billion facility currently under development, coupled with a 90 megawatt electrolyzer. And I'll speak about hydrogen in the, in the next little while. So maybe we'll stay with you, both of you uh, first. Uh, so your, your projects that you'll explain to us uh, depend heavily on the relationships you have either with the city of Stockholm or the city of Bahrain. Could you uh, explain those projects and how does the relationships you've developed with the cities actually influence uh, the outcome of, of your projects? Sure, I can go ahead. So I, I talked about, uh, I'll come to Bahrain, but uh, in, uh, with, in Edmonton, we co-locate uh, on, on the waste uh, management facility in Edmonton. So really, um, we're providing solutions for waste management, so we're a sustainable solution uh, for that. Um, in Varen, the project is is uh, is also uh, providing solutions for the ecosystem from a waste perspective, but also we use hydrogen. Uh, we you know co-locate the facility with uh, with a fairly large electrolyzer, 90 megawatt, where we uh, use hydrogen uh, as an as an input in our in our in our process that allows us to double the yield of our product. Um, hydrogen, high value commodity at this point, um, and, and this is how we can collaborate also with the industries and the communities, right? So how can we maximize the electricity that, that were provided to the project, making sure also that we can provide and supply uh, other industries with, with, uh, with uh, the excess uh, hydrogen that we produce, right? Uh, and, and this project is, is, is also made uh, possible because of the vision of a community, because of the vision of a, mis a municipality like Varenne, who created the conditions to attract those companies like us and Greenfield and others, right, that can benefit from the synergies that were created uh, by that time of, of, of vision and ultimately um, uh, the conditions that were put in place. Anders, how about your project CMG? Yeah, I can, I can take it from a little bit yeah. different perspective. Uh, our operations are mainly then based in urban areas, uh, uh, very dense urban areas also. And uh, the development of, of the city of Stockholm, uh, you, can, you can 
look at it uh, from, from any perspective. One perspective is that you need to have energy supply of a developing, uh, when you are developing a city. And, and then you also need to have uh, a common ambition and vision together with the municipality, otherwise you will go lost in that journey. Uh, and you can see on the decarbonization uh, journey, which Sweden and the Nordic countries has done, we were starting in the, uh, let's say, 1970s. We were more or less totally dependent on fossil fuels in the district heating sector in Sweden. The decarbonization from that part is now, we have more, more or less 97% renewables or, or uh, recovered energy in the system. So we have done the decarbonization journey in the sector, and that has been, of course, in very uh, tight dialogue also with the different stakeholders, like the municipalities, not like the natural uh, uh, regulation for uh, energy policies and, and so forth. And it's also so that <coughs> without having this, call it clear uh, vision and ambition with the municipality and different stakeholders who are actually building, investing in an urban area, it's very hard to see what are the solutions for the future. Uh, and I, I will give you a concrete example. Stockholm's development is need a lot of electricity. And, and how can you secure that you have capacity during the whole year? Uh, and our operation is then based on, on utilizing a lot of different sources, residuals from the sewage water where we can use heat pump and then uh, make it as district heating. We are using residuals from the forestry which otherwise also get lost and we can use it for combined heat and power plants. And when you're doing the combination of this, you can actually also secure electricity capacity for the city. Uh, and that's vital because without that capacity, you can't invest in new industries which are heavily dependent on, on electricity, like a data center, for instance. But when you then are allocating a data center to Stockholm, you should think about it from, from different perspective. What do you do with the excess heat from the data center? Of course, we are using that into the district heating system instead of just spoiling it over the roof. So then you can integrate a different part of the industry, different part of the municipality's action and the industries building in the urban area and combine that and see that, okay, if we are working together in close collaboration, we can find solutions which single industries, single municipalities can't do without it. So I would say that the, the whole concept of actually building up district heating sector in Sweden built for close collaboration between the society and the industry, and in this case, the utility sector. <coughs> Both your projects, uh, in comparison to uh, Julien's projects, are in urban areas uh, where public acceptance is, is very important. What are some of the challenges that you face when you try to develop those projects? Either, uh, you know, f trucks coming in, uh, bringing in the, 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 uh, the feedstock, uh, noise, smell. I mean, do you face some of those issues? And are, are they, uh, on a scale, are they the, probably the most important ones that you're facing in the projects? Or is it more of a technical aspect? I can start it and then we can maybe uh, do some complementary comments to each other. I, I think that these questions raise, of, it's obvious of course, of course there are challenges if you are uh, having operation in an urban area and you have a development, uh, call it roadmap, uh, and you would like to build a new uh, urban area or you would like to build a new traffic road or whatever you need to do. And then you need supply of different sources. You need the infrastructure for water, you need the infrastructure for electricity, you need the infrastructure for district heating. Uh, and if you don't then have a, a common vision about where we should be, uh, you will realize that you will, you will most likely fail. Uh, and so, so from a starting point, uh, without having uh, so close collaboration with the city so you can actually develop the district heating system, it will fail. Uh, and then, uh, if I give, give you an, another example from the forest industry. Utilizing residues from the forest, which are today left over in, in the Swedish forestry, uh, should, should stay in the forest and it should actually emit greenhouse gases more than if we actually bring it out from the forest and, and produce combined heat and power, both heat and electricity in our plants. And if it then take next step uh, and capture the carbon, it will, it will even be a more successful project. But 
having the collaboration with the forest industry, so they understand that we need actually to have so much residue from the forest taken out from the forest so we can build these kind of facilities is also important and build up the logistic chain and build up the whole value chain so it contributes both to the forest industry and to our operation and to the society. So it's a very complex system, I would say. Yeah, and just to build on that, uh, I think collaboration is key, right? So you need to make sure that you have developed that, you know, great relationship with the community. But in our case, so I didn't mention our feedstock is waste. So uh, no one's are, you know, huge fan of waste at one point, right? So but ex explaining what we do and what we do with it is, is critical. Uh, tomorrow's feedstock for the energy transition is not yesterday's feedstock. So it's the same, uh, you know, in, you know, for us producing uh, biofuels, low carbon fuels and circular chemicals for the hard to abate sectors, reusing existing materials. So we're recycling the carbon and the hydrogen out of existing materials instead of extracting new hydrocarbons in Alberta, for example. So explaining that, that it will be the same with, with electric cars, urban mining will be key, right? But you need to explain that it will be done close to your homes, in your communities, but then it's the job arguments, what you do, and how you, you, how you manage that feedstock. And for us, waste, obviously, it's trucked, right? So it means traffic, it means, you know, uh, we're rerouting, we're diverting waste from landfill and incineration. So it does have an impact. Uh, but we, you need to explain it, and you need to take your time, and you need to, uh, you need to collaborate. And that's why, in, in our project in Varennes, the, the, the creation of this hub of, of different industries and companies in the same locations allows us to, uh, to explain it better together with other partners of what we do and, and how we work in the energy transition. But it does require work, that's for sure. I'll have another question for you after, but I want to go to Julien because he has a totally different project out in the region, away from, well not that away from, from communities, but still you know, less impact on the communities. Tell us about your project and, 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 and maybe how does the, the, the regional energy ecosystem plays in your decarbonization strategy of, of ArcelorMittal? Okay. Uh, so we are the largest employer of the North Shore region in Quebec, of course. Uh, the second largest employer, though, is the forest industry. And uh, back in 2020, the largest forest company had to stop its operation because uh, due to uh, the shutdown of uh, the paper mill in the North Shore region, and and therefore which consumed their sub products, and so so uh, the mayor called us just to see if we can eventually work with them, and um, it was quite fortunate because uh, during that time they have built a facility to produce pyrolytic oil by using their sub products. Uh, but the business model wasn't quite there, and we thought that it was too expensive for us to move uh, by using their uh, uh, pyrolytic oil. Uh, but we found a way, uh, just because they are using our railway, to find a complete supply chain with them and to build a business model that actually works for both of us by using our railway in, in one hand and us by using their pyrolytic oil their produce after that. So the, the mayor of Port Cartier was, was really important because he was the one who has been able to gather us around the same table. And after that, just to, to, to discuss and to find a way to, pr to, uh, to use that pyrolytic oil. So nowadays, I, I mean today, we are uh, the first pelletizing plant using pyrolytic oil on a permanent basis. I know that you guys Swedish are very good by using it, but uh, we've, been, uh, we've been the first at least to use on a permanent basis that pyrolytic oil. So uh, it's, uh, it's a great accomplishment. Today we are using 16 million liters per year, and we have project to increase that capacity to pr consume 32 million liters per year. Uh, which will result in massive carbon uh, reduction, uh, and we will be able to achieve our target to reduce by 25% our greenhouse gas emission by 2030. So uh, it's it's almost done uh, by using this local ecosystem that we uh, have been able to put in place with them. 
obviously, Ahsad Amital is not an organization that tomorrow is going to, to, to fail or to close, but you are creating in your community, in the communities where you operate, a certain dependency. Uh, do, do you think that, uh, that communities fear that, that they, that, they, that they fear being so dependent on what Ahsad Amital, the role that Ahsad Amital takes or plays into taking uh, wood subsidies or, 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 or other uh, rejects from, the, from other manufacturing facilities? This is a great question, Ibar, because um, by, by being so much integrated in, into uh, one single region, if one fails, the other could fail too. So we both uh, had to put in place a mitigation plan if we uh, stop using their periodic oil because of the market conditions or, or if they are unable to produce it, uh, how we can go back to using fossil fuel. So, uh, so, so this is a this is a, a center point, and and by saying that, if one of us fail, uh, the economic impact could be very very massive on the on the locality, so on the community. So, we need to, uh, to we help them to build a more resilient economy because they are diversified, and then they can find eventually a new consumer for the product, and we prove that the quality of the product is working quite well. So, so the future is bright for them, uh, for our partner. But still, uh, the, 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 the risk is still there, saying that if we one of us fail, the other one could easily bring the other one into, uh, into a failure as well. So we need to manage that and just to be conscious that, uh, that uh, we are based on local communities and we need to support them and eventually to find another way. So what we are planning to do with this partner is to help them to diversify their product and to go eventually to biocarbon, uh, which we can use to replace the coke breeze that we put in our pellets. So they will both you producing mainly pyrolytic oil, but also biocarbon by the same process of paralysis. So, so maybe the diversification will help them to be a little bit more resilient and just not uh, wait for us to, to buy their product and eventually to have to stop their operation just like the paper mill did three years ago. So. Maybe on, on, on resilient communities, uh, do, do you feel that regional energy ecosystems actually play a central role in creating resilient communities? And and before you answer that, maybe to Jean-Francois and Angel, um, you're probably more aware of this, um, but um, th there is a, in, in, in Denmark a, 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 an organization by the name of Nature Energy that actually uses uh, agricultural waste to produce energy and, 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 and biogas. Um, do you think that, the, that it would be feasible in, 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 in Stockholm or outside of Stockholm and, and maybe in Varenne or outside of Varenne to have projects like this? Do you think it would be uh, acceptable? Obviously, smell and, and trucking is, is, is a key impact, but I know it's not in your field. I'm just curious as to hear you on, on, on agricultural waste as a, as a feedstock. Yeah, well, we use ag we can use ag ag waste uh, as as a as a feedstock for us. It's uh, it's it's a great uh, feedstock. It has a lot of biogenic content. Ultimately, it helps to you know to increase the biogenic content of the end product. But I'll, I'll just step back a little bit. I just mentioned so Anarchem we're a technology provider, right? So we uh, you know we can either uh, develop projects in working with strategic partners, you know the uh, oil and gas uh, companies that can help. That you know that can you know develop and will be working with us in developing your projects. They will own, they will operate the facility. We provide the license. We work with them uh, in developing that project, right? So in order to happen for those projects, Enricam with others, we have to pave the way. So we have to create an environment into which they'll be it will be appealing for those companies to go ahead with those projects, right? Without that, you know, without that signal, they're less interested a little bit. So it's on our job, you know, in working and in, in creating those those conditions. Now the other way on developing this is is doing it uh, a bit from scratch. So doing the work in developing uh, the projects, uh, greenfield, brownfield, uh, so that we 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 permit it, we find the site, uh, we uh, we we permit it, and then 
uh, we have enough taker potentially, right? And then not potentially, we have enough taker as, as a condition, then we can sell the product so that new owner will operate it. My point is, in that case, working in find the, with the community, with finding the site, the location, does require a lot of work, right? Energy transition projects now, there are many of them. Uh, we're all chasing the same site and locations. And, and showing that you can uh, work and, and provide an added value in a specific location is not something that is just nice. It's, it's required, right? It's the new way of doing business. It's the new way of, of making sure that we're maximizing the energy that we'll be using in a site. How can we find synergies with different partners? And I'll just give an example. We're developing with, 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 a, with a partner a project in North and Northwestern Europe uh, in a very uh, in a high demand location. Uh, and, you know, believe me, for us to, you know, really get that side, we need to demonstrate that first we have a very strong project, that we have enough taker, but ultimately showing that we can bring something else, right, to the existing tenant of that site. Uh, so it's something that we work on uh, on a daily basis, and it's something that now it's the, it's, it's, it's the new norm, right? It, it has to be done, and it's something that is, uh, is, is expected. Maybe to, well, you want to add something to this? Uh? I, I think I, I could put the, the regional ecosystem in, into s some other perspective also. I think we have all uh, a very, very challenging task, and that is, of course, to decarbonize the whole society and, and all sectors. We're talking about aviation, we're talking about transportation, we're talking about other sectors as well, of course. And there will be hard to abate emissions left. But during this decarbonization journey, there are different opportunities in different regions and in different regional ecosystems. Uh, and if I look, for instance, uh, compared to uh, Enerchem, we are also a waste handling company or waste management company, but we are producing electricity uh, and heat and taking care of the heat and excess heat to the district heating system. And we are uh, producing electricity, which can be used for electrification of the, the traffic system. And if you look at the Nordics, for instance, we are going for total electrification of the more or less the whole industry in order to make it possible to m produce fossil-free steel, to produce uh, other fossil-free products, and that's a must in the future. But there will be there will be different opportunities in different regions, and you need to look at what kind of opportunities are the best ones for exactly this location. And if I then go back to Stockholm and see, okay, what? What are the ambitions for the Reno system? Each and one needs to have, uh, I call it a very high ambitions regarding climate. And in Stockholm, for, of course, they have a net zero target or they, have, they need to be climate neutral. And how should that regional ecosystem be climate neutral without having also, call it removals somewhere? Either they need to purchase removals, permanent carbon removals, which we are producing in our site, or they need to, to purchase them from another place. So, so when we can integrate carbon removal to our existing combined heat and power plant, using them as an extra production fleet, and then also permanently take away the carbon and store it, we will create advantages for the Stockholm region to be climate neutral and net zero. Uh, and then when we have the ma waste management, we can use it in, in, in another way than Enerkim do in Stockholm. And we have handled the, the waste management since the landfill was uh, banned in 1990s. Uh, and that, uh, that has, of course, caused an industry which are extremely efficient of taking care of the waste and producing electricity and um, <coughs> heat. But then we need to continue that journey because if we, we see that the fossil plastic material is there, we will emit CO2 from our chimneys and then we need carbon capture also on waste incineration plants. And when we capture that way, that carbon, that could be used together with hydrogen and then we can start to produce products again. So, so I think there is several different technologies which also needs to be interacting with each other and we need to find the best solutions also for different regions. Otherwise, I think we, it will go too slow. Maybe a, a general question to all three of you. I mean, obviously this is very interesting. What are, what are the, the pitfalls and what are the, f the, 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 the factors of success in the projects that you're, you're developing? Maybe we'll start with you, Julien. Um, reality check. 
I wouldn't have been able to use the periodical even if I wanted, if we uh, had not been able to put in place a very innovative business model between our two companies. Uh, why? Because uh, the periodical is, of course, a little bit more expensive to produce than, than the fossil fuels, the bunker oil that we used. And in order to not degrade our uh, competitiveness, we had to find a way to, to find a business model that help us at least to uh, replace uh, the bunker oil at the zero sum cost. Uh, we've been able to do so by even more integration with our partners. So the key is really confidence and, 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 and trust between partners. Um, so, so again, by, by using our railway to bring down their wood log to Port Cartier and after that to produce the, 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 the subproduct of the, of the, the, the forest mill, we've been able to integrate the entire operation and to find a way to have a zero-sum uh, cost transition uh, for, for our company. Otherwise, it would have been quite very, very difficult just to push that project and to get the capex uh, to, uh, to get so, even with the carbon tax and the carbon price. So this is really have to be taken into consideration uh, it's quite difficult to be uh, to, to be competitive uh, in Canada because our our uh, workforce is quite expensive, and as you know, our projects are expensive. The capex requirement is huge. So if you compare against other jurisdiction that uh, where the prices are quite lower than uh, than our operations you need to find a way to innovate and to find new solution that doesn't exist. And this is what we put in place with our partner because they trust, they, they put their trust in us, but also they find a way to, uh, to, have a, 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 to have a good price for the product as well because of the integration of the, the supply chain. So, so that was the key of the success, but also the, the risk factor there is, is always the competitiveness for, for large business like us. Jean-François? Yeah, Jean yeah. <coughs> so I think, I think the challenge is, is, is to find the right balance between uh, the carrot and the stick, right? Regulations uh, and, and incentives, ultimately, because uh, financing is, is obviously a, a, a big issue. I mean, energy transition, we're trying, you know, we're working hard all to, to decarbonize the economy here. No one's against apple pie. Who wants to pay for it? I think that's, that it, it comes down to that, right? And Asolari is doing it on a, on a voluntary basis, so we're unable to pass the cost to their customers. Uh, we target the hard to abate sectors, uh, marine aviations. Everyone, you know, wants our molecule and the molecules of our competitors or, or uh or the industry, but no one, no one wants to pay for it. So how, how do you go beyond that, right? So regulations, putting everyone on the same, le level, you know, same level playing field, making sure that it's the same for everyone in a, in a given sector. So that really helps to, to incentivize uh, the demand, right? The, 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 the supply, I mean. So uh, I think this is key then incentive to support lower the capex of those projects and ultimately working on the offtake, right? So what can we do to help the aviation sector to really transition towards sustainable aviation fuel? How can we make sure that ultimately we'll have the, uh, the environment in place so that they will be, uh, you know, they will accept to pay the additional cost because there is, it's more expensive, uh, you know, to decarbonize at this point with, with our product than it is using the traditional product, right? There's a reason for that, right? We're just at the beginning of this, this great adventure. Same in the marine sector. So regulation is key. And then the finance community, right? So I think I have some colleagues here that will be able to say that it's, it's not uh, very easy. And the reason being, it, you know, the, the, the finance community is very used in, in, in supporting the transition, financing wind, solar, energy storage projects. That's easy. Now we need to focus on what's harder, the hard to abate sectors. You know, we produce a molecule that we sell on the spot market. It's a commodity, right? So it, it's very challenging to finance those type, those type of projects. Finding uptakers, having the right set of regulations in, in place is really key to get this, uh, this moving forward. Anders? 
of course, I, I agree with the regulation is the key uh, in order to actually succeed with this, call it decarbonization of the hard to abate uh, sector or sectors. Uh, but I, I also think that uh, I can give a concrete example, uh, our project and when we are will capturing more or less 800,000 tons, uh, kilotons of, of uh, carbon dioxide annually. It's uh, as much as the traffic emits in Stockholm during one year in one single project. Uh, we need every fourth day, we need a new project like that if we should reach the 1.5 target uh, according to Paris Agreement. Uh, and then you can see, okay, how should you, you're talking about a project which can be used in the marine sector or uh, can be used in other sectors. We are talking about a product which you can't more or less see because you will permanently take it away because we need to do that. Uh, and there you can see that uh, w three years ago when I was in Glasgow, no one talked about carbon removal more or less. Today, it's a must more or less wherever we are. We are talking a lot uh, of carbon capture from the, from, the fo from the fossil industry and different industries. And of course, that's needed because we need to do the reduction. But that will be in the reduction. It's not enough. Uh, we need also removal. And then we need to have biogenic carbon capture or ducts, uh, direct air capture, in order to actually make sure that that carbon can be permanently removed and storage. Uh, and then, what are the, what are the challenges? The, the challenges are, of course, how should the business model look like? And initially, uh, you can see quite clear signs now that there are a voluntary carbon market starting to move quite rapidly. Large companies in the world, they see that it's a must to reach net zero. Many companies in the world set up SBTI targets. And SBTI targets, if you have a net zero target there, you need to compensate in the, finally for the, the hardest to abate part. And that means that carbon needs to have a price also when you remove it. So putting up that, uh, call it financial sector, need to be involved, regulations need to be involved, and carbon will be a com commodity in the future, which we traded mostly in the world. That's the challenge. How do we reach that point? Uh, but I, I'm quite sure that that trend has already started. Uh, and we can clearly see now in our project that we have uh, offtakes of half our volumes already now, and they are more look looking at how will the regulation be? Are we, is it possible for us to actually purchase these permanent carbon removals? And, and I would say that in, in Europe now, that framework is taking place. We can see it's in, in different nations in Europe, it's also taking place. But that takes time and it, we don't have the time. I think that's, that's also a challenge itself because we need to invest and we need to invest now. And if we should be ready 2027, we need to have the regulation yesterday. And we're still waiting for parts of it, but it will be taking place 2024. And I guess that's the same challenge that you are meeting. And I think it's the same challenge in other sectors as well. <coughs> um, we're going to have in Quebec uh, a great uh, Swedish company to, that will establish themselves in the next couple of years called Nordvolt. Um, Nordvolt is coming in with the, the ambition to create the most greenest battery in North America, or maybe perhaps in the world because of, of of local lithium, local nickel, uh, no local graphite, uh, green, green uh, hydroelectricity. And, and surprisingly enough, um, so far, they're not as welcomed as we thought they would be. And um, this is probably a, a question to all of you. As we will see more and more projects like the ones you're developing uh, in, in, in your regions, either in, in, in further away regions or in cities, what will managers need to, to, to have or w what type of strategies will they need to put forward in order to convince local communities to, to accept more and more projects, more solar panels, more windmills, more um, uh, small uh, nuclear uh, modules? I mean, it, it, uh, as we move forward, the projects you're, you're bringing, they will be you know, multiplying by three, four times do you think that we will see th the end of public acceptability for those projects? Uh, I can take some examples for s from Sweden. Uh, I think if you will do the electrification of the, of the industries and the society and the transportation sector, you need a lot of electricity. 
and you need renewable electricity. And in the Nordic countries, you have extreme good conditions for, for wind power. But uh, public acceptance is uh, at stake. Uh, no one wants to have this on their own backyard. Uh, and then instead, the politicians look at, okay, we build nuclear instead. And initially, that, of course, then received much more uh, public acceptance because no one thinks they will build close to them. Uh, but in the end, it will be located somewhere and you will have a public discussion again regarding that. And I think this, this is, an, uh, I think it's a global issue actually. How do we reach acceptance for, for actually doing investments which actually are needed in, in the energy transition and then the energy transformation? And uh, I, I think that the only thing to do is actually to continue presenting the, the results doing uh, a lot of investment also to actually limit the negative consequences of because everything has some kind of consequence. Uh, and then also, uh, I think it, it's ju we need just to be consistent and understand that we need to have also renewables in our backyard. We need to have solar panels on our roofs. We need to have wind power in the forest. We need to have uh, industries which actually are also uh, having a quite huge effect locally on, on certain things, but it needs to be handled in, in a call it constructive and with regulations around it. I think that's the only way. If I can just uh, build on that. I think people are just starting to realize the, 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 the magnitude of the change that will that is required to mitigate the adverse impact of climate change, right? So it started with few wind farms here and there. Now you have to multiply it and and then to make it you know way bigger. And same with you know in the sector that 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 we work in, developing low carbon uh, fuels and chemicals. Uh, we have a fairly large project in Montreal. It's a drop in in the ocean, frankly, right? So you need to multiply that. And I think one way of bringing communities together that we need to we need to start talking about the the, the plane ride, but rather the beach, right? So when when Air Canada when they do some advertising you know you, they don't they don't show you stuck in uh, you know in an airplane seat right for six or eight hours uh, or 15 coming to the cup right they show you the city they show you the beach right so you, you, we need to explain what solutions we bring to the system right so Anarchan's te technology platform what it enables right well it helps you to ultimately it gives you uh, the social license to fly again right it helps you to reduce the, the carbon the carbon density of the the IKEA uh, sofa that you're going to buy so but we need to be better at explaining that we need to uh, uh, embrace it more and we need to uh, bring everyone in the same boat it's a very challenging uh, you know task to do Julien talk to me about your beach <laughs> <laughs> what's your beach Julien my beach is in Fermont <laughs> you should see that it's a snow beach <laughs> um, but you see, uh, it, it, our challenge on social acceptability is quite different, of course, because we are operating far away from the, from the, the, the big cities. Uh, that means that quite often the commentators don't quite understand our reality. So we are a mining company, partner with the forest industry, uh, two, two businesses that are, well, have some issues with the social acceptance. And, uh, and so we need to really explain exactly what we're doing, otherwise we will have uh, uh, strong backfires from the, 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 the people in the big cities saying that, what are you doing? Are you uh, harvesting the forest to, uh, to, uh, to feed the steel industry? Uh, that could be a shortcut that it could be quite damageable. So we need to explain exactly what we're doing. Partner with the First Nation is very important very, very important for us because we need to include them uh, in, in different ways, you know. They, they see us uh, as a, they see themselves and this is what they are as a true potential partner into that local region ecosystem that we want to build in. And we uh, are welcoming them saying, what do you want to do with us? This is where we're going and we need to engage a strong conversation with them to build a strength, uh, let's say, a um, uh, bigger social acceptability surrounding our project. And we need to make sure that we are not cutting good trees for our purpose. And it is quite difficult for the forest industry because, you know, it's quite difficult if you do not take, let's say, uh, 
in French, it's called the essence sans preneur, which is the trees that are not going into the 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 the, the, the wood industry. Uh, so, so you cannot cut them for energy purposes. Otherwise, you would cut. Uh, and it's really really difficult for them, you know, just to to make the right cut at the right moment and not just having simply their waste. So we need to partner with them and, and just to educate also the government by this is what we're going to do. It will help the forest to regenerate a little bit faster and how we can maybe build other partnership just to make, to, to make see them ourselves as the gardener of the forest uh, in Quebec. So this is the kind of question that I raised to my friend Jean Nollet, how we can manage that with the, with the Quebec government and see how they can maybe uh, just look at our project and see what future we want to build with the, with the local communities. Otherwise, you know, uh, what for us could happen more frequently. This is what we saw uh, last summer in Quebec, uh, the, 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 the diseases, uh, disease uh, in, um, in, uh, in the wood uh, could happen more easily. So. We need to regenerate the forest more and more, and uh, and I think uh, this is uh, this is not quite understood in the uh, in the big cities. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Um, <coughs> I know there's a lot of people from Quebec in the room, but <laughs> actually, is there someone who is not from Quebec in the room? I think it would be easier to find out. Oh, there is one. Um, so maybe if you have a question, I'll I'll I'll, I'll pass you the microphone, but. Uh, is there anybody who has any questions for our guests or our speakers um, based on what you've heard? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, well, if you don't, you have... Oh, Jean, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if I do it in French or in English, but uh, actually uh, this question of uh, social acceptability is, is, is a huge question and I'm... Uh, I hear that you all find that this is an important issue, and I want, uh, are you hopeful that things are going to change on that side? Do you see a path that people, the general population, could understand what is at, at stake and, and would finally get out of the uh, not-in-my-backyard syndrome? I, I, do, you, do you see a way forward for that? I can give a comment that I, I think that it will not be easily handled uh, and we uh, I think all stakeholders in the industry will will need to work extremely heavily with this uh, with this question uh, but I can also see that when we, when we are framing different projects in a different way it reach uh, much higher public acceptance than otherwise and, and I can take this carbon removal project for, for instance as, as uh, a case when we launched that, uh, we started from the perspective how we could contribute to the society of Stockholm and the Stockholm region. And setting up that, that scene quite clearly that Stockholm will reach, it will be the first capital in Europe, maybe in the world, who will be actually climate neutral. Uh, and to be that, we need to do this roadmap. Uh, and one part and one huge part of that and one necessary part of that is actually that we build these carbon removal facilities on all our combustion, combined heat and power plants in, in the Stockholm region. And that makes the process much, much easier. Uh, but that was a process also which was quite uh, combined with, with the municipality of Stockholm and other stakeholders and also clearly showed what we need to do together in order to make this happen. And I can say that the environmental process has gone uh, much faster than I expected. Uh, the discussion with different uh, stakeholders is much better. What's remaining, and that was you raised the question, and I think that's a question which uh, we can share with Sweden and, and, and Quebec, that's, that's the forestry. How to make sure that the forestry is a sustainable forestry, that we are utilizing the forestry in a sustainable way so that we will, we will uh, it will be a carbon sink, it will be used for, for buildings, it will be used for other purposes, and we, we are not overusing it. Uh, and we are not uh, also using forest in areas where it should definitely not be used. So, so I think what we have spent tremendous time on is uh, the Red Free Directive, which is a European directive for how to use sustainable residues. It's extremely uh, rigorous, and it also puts us in a position so we can never, never utilize 
forestry, which could go to other purposes for, for the building sector, for instance. So this kind of, of measures needs to be taken much more seriously from, from our indifferent industries. If we avoid to, or if we take these questions lightly, the public acceptance, and don't work with them really, really hard, we will fail. But I, I'm, of course, I think we will succeed, but it, it can take different times. Yeah, and it, it speaks about um, you know, having uh, good partners, right, and in, in, in good relationship uh, with, the, with the communities and, and the other industries that you're in. In our project in Varennes, the mayor, Mayor Narpus, is a real champion. Like he had a vision, this is what he wanted to do with a very deprived area where he used to have uh, oil, you know, industrial applications, uh, uh, processes, and he, he had this vision, and he, he brought the conditions together so that companies and projects uh, like like us, the one that is based on our technology, you know, went there, and along with others in creating this, he was expl able to explain it to his community, and now it's a big success, right? So, but I think that's an easy one. Like the next one might be a bit more difficult. What I'm very worried about is is the pushback that we're now seeing in uh, globally, right? In North America and Europe, on carbon tax on energy transition incentives uh, and, and measures, right? Uh, it, it is now, unfortunately, highly polarizing issue. You're seeing that in the United States with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and how uh, different, uh, you know, political parties are positioning themselves. 2024 will be a very high risk year in the energy transition world. Election in the US, election in the EU, and all those uh, great measures and great successes that we were able to build, uh, frankly, in easy, in fairly easy years. Now that we're seeing inflation, you know, costs are you know uh, are more expensive for everyone, and and those are the measures that might just be be stopped or be, might be changed very much. That ultimately will change the entire environment that those projects will be will be built. So, uh, great relationships at the local level when we uh, develop our projects, but also. Uh, we need support uh, to uh, to encourage um, governments to come with some very progressive uh, policies and regulations to, to make sure that those projects are, are being developed in, in the right environment. And, and this is, it's it's a very risky time that we're entering. Julie, but uh, well, almost. Uh, maybe uh, Jean, your answer is in the title. You need to build the regional, uh, energy ecosystem to fight against the not in my backyard effect. So, uh, so, so, so it's probably the best way, you know, just because it is in your backyard, but you are building something that is fully integrated. It's good for the local communities. Perhaps it's the way to, uh, to, to, to build those projects and, and by having those strong local partnership and, and, and and I don't know, maybe um, maybe they, they, this is the way to build things now. And just to make sure that you have the proper consumer, the, the, the proper energy, the proper usage of the energy that is produced there. It's probably the, the best key to, um, to fight against the not uh, in my backyard effect. All right, well, it has, I think we're five minutes away from the end. Uh, if, if there are there any other questions in the room? Um, if not, I think there is one conclusion that I, I would make is that it's, it's definitely more challenging today to develop projects, especially in the energy sector, than it was many years ago. Um, I was meeting someone from, from your government, uh, Anders, earlier today, and, and, the, and we were talking about dam developments that were done in the 1970s where we didn't really ask indigenous people if they wanted us to build the dam or not, and we didn't really care about carbon and, uh, and, and rivers and the environmental impact, and not in, that, not in my backyard did not exist. So I, I think we're, we're going to be facing challenging, uh, challenging times to develop those projects, but you have proven, proven that it's feasible. In, 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 in all three cases, so congratulations. And thank you for sharing your, your thoughts uh, this afternoon with us. And uh, on that note, I wish you a good afternoon and a good cup uh, for the Quebec delegation. It's starting tomorrow with the minister, so hopefully you'll all be there on time. And uh, we'll see you in the next couple of days. Thank you very much. <laughs>